when you say that the Finns uh, in the territory that the Soviets took in Karelia were evacuated to Finland, it was 400,000 people, which was more than 10% of the population of Finland. Welcome to Shield of the Republic, a podcast sponsored by the Bulwark and the Miller Center of Public Affairs at the University of Virginia, and dedicated to the proposition articulated by Walter Lippmann during World War II that a strong and balanced foreign policy is the necessary shield of our democratic republic. I'm Eric Edelman, counselor at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, a Bulwark contributor, and a non-resident fellow at the Miller Center. My partner in this enterprise, Elliot Cohen, is away today, but I'm happy to have as our very special guest, Professor Kimo Rentala, Emeritus Professor of Political History at the University of Helsinki. Professor Rentala has previously also been a Professor of History at Turku University in Finland, and he is the author of a recently released book in English, How Finland Survived Stalin from Winter War to Cold War. It is a remarkable work of uh, scholarship that is based on deep archival research, multi-archival research, multinational archival research in the archives of Russia, of Finland, of Sweden, the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, as well as uh, deep reading in the secondary literature uh, and the published documentary evidence as well. So, Professor Rentala, welcome to Shield of the Republic. Okay, thank you. I want to start uh, by telling our, um, our viewers a story about um, my own time uh, in Finland as the U.S. ambassador, uh, Max Jakobsen, who you knew, uh, the late Max Jakobsen, a, a distinguished Finnish diplomat and historian in his own right, who wrote one of the early histories, diplomatic histories of the Winter War, um, would frequently recount a story of, uh, as a young diplomat, uh, as the press attaché in the Finnish embassy here in Washington, uh, preparing for the visit of then Finnish President Urho Kekkonen uh, to Washington to meet with President Kennedy in 1961. And uh, I won't go uh, into the entire story, but uh, improbably, Max found himself on uh, uh, Air Force One flying to Hyannisport on a Friday afternoon uh, with President John F. Kennedy. And President Kennedy uh, asked him, a question, and that question was, we Americans have always wondered why it was that alone among all the nations that bordered the Soviet Union, the Soviets never actually occupied uh, and turned Finland into a, a people's democracy. And uh, Max noted in some of the, his writings where he recounted this story that it didn't seem to have occurred to President Kennedy that it might have had something to do with the Finns. And I think it's fair to say that your book really is, I think, the definitive answer to President Kennedy's question about why it, why it is exactly that Stalin uh, proved either unwilling or unable or a little bit of both uh, to impose his will on Finland. So could we start, I mean, you really focus in your book on three episodes, the Winter War that uh, began uh, much, much as the recent war against Ukraine uh, began in 2022 with a false uh, flag uh, accusation that Finland had started firing on uh, on um, on Russia, on the Soviet on Soviet Russia. Um, tell us how how did how did this all work out? Uh, you know, so splendidly for the for the Finns in the in the end of the day. It turned out to, I when I was writing this book, I noticed that. Uh, I didn't uh, had the idea in advance, but I noticed that uh, uh, the same pattern was repeated three times. First, uh, Stalin uh, put on a maximum program. He wanted to, to submit the whole thing under the Soviet system. I think he, in his head he had this idea that uh, he had to get back the frontiers of 1914, before the First World War. And Finland was part of the Russian Empire uh, at that time. 
and and he was successful in in all directions and and he uh, he tried to get Finland incorporated in, in 39 when he began the winter war and then in two uh, later occasions in 44 also he demanded unconditional surrender and in in 48 he planned a military treaty military alliance with the between Finland and, and Soviet Union in all these he first tried uh, getting full control but then uh, when troubles arose the international situation and the Finnish resistance uh, created situation when uh, he saw that this is not so easy and he was able to to stop track and uh, uh, be contented with much less uh, than the original plan was Let's talk a little bit about um, the different elements that you describe um, that explain why Stalin was uh, willing to change course and uh, in the end. Uh, certainly the first was Finnish resistance. Can you, can you talk a little bit about um, how that played out in, in the Winter War? I mean, I think as you have, I know, said publicly, uh, the number of, of Soviet um, killed in action uh, at the time was only really a number released, um, you know, in the 19, I think, 80s or 90s. Um, so talk, talk a little bit about the Finnish resistance and then perhaps talk a little bit about the quality of Finnish statesmanship. I, I was struck in reading the book about the role of, um, of uh, Marshall, uh, and then later President Mannerheim, but also uh, President Pasakivi, both in, in the 1944 and 1948 episodes. Um, and then you mentioned the changing international circumstances played a role here, too. I think all three of these factors played a role, but perhaps you could talk a little bit about each one. Yeah. The resistance, I think the basis was created by, uh, by Stalin himself because before the winter war uh, the original soviet demands were rather small some islands in the baltic sea and and transfer of border probably 25 kilometers or or something like that uh, of course he would have later on uh, wanted more but that that was the beginning but when he attacked he put up a, a puppet government a false government for finland and uh, and gave order to his troops that uh, they must salute the Swedes on the border, which may mean that uh, to conquer the, the whole Finland. And uh, I think that created, the Finns saw that this is not about some small islands. This is about life and death. And so they fought very hard. And the Soviet laws, they, they published the, the figures of their uh, soldiers lost in the winter war only uh, 50 years after the war and it turned out that uh, they lost uh, 126 126,000 soldiers dead in the winter war which is quite a lot because it, it only last the war lasted uh, 105 days a little more than three months so it was a huge fierce furious struggle that Finns were able to put up. The Finns, they didn't believe in the beginning that, that the Soviets would attack, at least not in the uh, harsh winter conditions, but they did it and, and it was a, a big mistake. And biggest disasters were suffered by uh, Soviet troops trying to realize uh, plans added to their attack plan by Stalin himself. So he got quite a harsh lesson there. He, of course, he uh, underestimated the Finnish capacity to resistance, as Putin has done in the Ukrainian war recently. Yes, um, and one of the things that struck me uh, when I was uh, reading uh, the book was the degree to which the outnumbered Finns were uh, extremely adaptive uh, and creative, uh, much the way 
uh, you saw the Ukrainians in the early days of uh, 2022. Uh, and one of the inventions uh, that the Finns had, they didn't have the benefit, obviously, of precision guided anti-tank munitions that the Ukrainians had, but they adopted their own version of that, which was that they were the ones who invented uh, the Molotov cocktail, the, the uh, improvised explosive that disabled many, many uh, Russian tanks. Yeah, that's right. And how did Molotov feel about that? Did you find any evidence in the well, in the Russian? <laughs> I'm sure archive? he was not happy that <laughs> this was called Molotov cocktail, but uh, he couldn't change it. It, uh, it was distributed all over the world, uh, the nom nomination. I think many of our viewers and listeners may not know that um, the Winter War, as you said, lasted uh, for only 105 days into the spring of 1940. But once the, um, once the Germans invaded uh, the Soviet Union in, in um, 1941, Finland sought to get back the territory that it had lost uh, in the treaty negotiations. Um, first, can you explain you know, why it was that, you know, what, what in the world situation in 1940 led Stalin to um, uh, settle for less than he might have originally uh, in the face of all this Finnish opposition. Uh, but, but then you know, what, uh, what led to the outbreak of the so-called continuation war from 1941 to 44 and how that ended and what, what, what kept Stalin from uh, demanding even more of Finland in 1944 than he had in, in 1940. You know, uh, at the end of the Winter War? In, uh, in 1940, in the Winter War, I think the main thing that changed Stalin's mind, in, in the main international uh, factor was uh, the Western aid plans. Britain and, and France, which were already at war with, with German, Germany, but they were not uh, waging the war yet. Uh, they planned to give help to Finland and Stalin was not afraid of them coming to the north Norway and, and northern Finland which was part, part of the plan but he was very much afraid when he uh, through espionage uh, got the information that the western powers planned to bomb Baku and other, other oil cities on the Caspian Sea because that was the only oil available for the Soviet Union at that time and uh, it would have been very destructive for them in the, during the war if you lose, lose your oil during the war at that time. Uh, and, and then he also decided that it is great hurry now to make peace before the Western powers can do the bombing. Because they, the British were in Iraq and, and the, the French were in Syria, so Caucasus was uh, under reach. They, they could they could bomb it quite easily and in the second war I think Finland would not have taken part so easily in the German attack uh, against the Soviet Union without the winter war but uh, when an occasion to get back what was lost arose with the German attack it was quite easy to to get Finland to join but in in 1944 it was clear that uh, Finland was on the losing side again and uh, and Stalin uh, was on two minds there in, in 1944 he saw that it, it would be possible to, to go on the same basis as, as after the winter war but then he became greedy and when the Soviet big attack, general attack in June 1944 was in the beginning, it was successful. Uh, and he demanded surrender, unconditional surrender, which would have lead, lead it into occupation. Uh, but then the Finnish put up more resistance and uh, stiffer resistance. And then also the international situation changed so that the Western powers uh, made the invasion in Normandy, in France. and. Uh, the 
Soviet commanders in the Finnish front, they asked more troops to, to submit Finland. But Stalin denied, because after the Western invasion and its success, it was a great hurry to Berlin, who would be the first one there. And that helped Finland quite a lot, because Stalin couldn't add forces in these directions. And the forces which were there were exhausted and, and couldn't produce any more results. So Finland was helped by this. And then also in 44, Poland was a factor in the sense that uh, there was this insurrection of Warsaw uh, when the Red Army became closer, became closer and Stalin was not uh, willing to help the Poles to success in this. And this uh, made his relations uh, with Western allies much worse than it used to be. And he needed something to show the Western allies that he is able to be moderate. And Finland was used for that purpose also by him. In the case of the, you know, the 1940 and the allied uh, plans to help uh, Finland, this is a case where um, it, your book is fascinating uh, on this subject because this is a case where intelligence information may have led to conclusions that were in fact uh, you know more than what the reality would have led one to believe which is to say yes the british and french were talking about sending forces uh, to finland um, uh, but there were, you know, it's not clear how serious that planning was. And as far as bombing Baku, it, it, it seems that that was never really uh, a serious plan by, by the allies. So in some sense, uh, Stalin, and as you point out, Stalin privileged information that was clandestinely, um, uh, uh, obtained by uh, Soviet intelligence, as opposed to what governments were saying and formal diplomatic communications. A and it may, in this instance, have been the case that he was misled by the intelligence to take an action that spared Finland that, you know, wasn't really going to be in the cards anyway. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it was, I think it seems so that the uh when the winter war began and, and Stalin uh, saw that this is different what what he thought uh, in advance, uh, I think he believed that the British probably had misled him by uh, feeding him with false information. They had uh, uh, reported, the, the, he spies the Cambridge Five and, and others have reported about the uh, uh, defeatist mood in, in the Finnish leadership and, and uh, uh, the idea that the West would not do anything came, came from the intelligence sources also. And, and Stalin believed that the British had tried to uh, lead him into a trap. And, uh, and he cut all relations with the Cambridge Five during the Winter War. And uh, that made him dependent on, on uh, intelligence from France, the French sources, more or less. And, uh, and the French sources exaggerated the Western plans much more than the, the British. And, uh, and the French sources were mainly immigrants, Russian immigrants, who hoped very much the uh, collapse of Bolshevism and, and all such things and, and reported that now the huge plans are developed in, in Western countries. So Stalin got probably a wrong impression of the Western plans and saw them through, through his intelligence sources uh, as uh, more dangerous than they actually were. And uh, I think the, the British didn't try to mislead him. It, the situation changed. It was, uh, uh, the information was correct. The Finns were, Finns were afraid, afraid of, this, of defeat in the war if, if the Soviet attack and, uh, and the British at that time were not willing to help. 
But when Finns, uh, Finnish resistance gave the Western powers time to develop plans and, and give assistance, uh, the popular opinion in these countries, in, in France and, and Britain, uh, made also their effort to, uh, to help this small nation under attack. And uh, so there also, the information about, uh, given before the war, was correct, more or less, to Stalin. But then the situation changed. And uh, also the Western attitudes and, and the Finnish attitudes, they changed from what they have been before the Soviet attack. Yeah, I do want to talk about um, a bit about the... Uh, Finnish diplomacy and, and statesmanship here, because as a small country um, with a very big neighbor, um, it it does seem, as you read uh, your book, to that uh, Finnish leaders were extremely attuned to the shifting currents of international affairs, and had a a, a real sense of timing of what the right timing was uh, when it you know was necessary to actually make a deal uh, and, and in many of these instances you find um, Finnish leaders employing delaying tactics to try and buy time play for time until circumstances uh, changed is that a fair a fair assessment I think yes of course there were not many in the Finnish leadership who were uh, aware of the whole international situation, but those who were Mannerheim, uh, Paasikivi, and social democratic leader Weiner Tanner, uh, they were rather cool-headed in this sense. They were, they were able to calculate the situation and, and saw the opportunity. You see it clearly in, in 1944 when uh, the only occasion when a peace uh, deal was possible was then when, when Germany had vacant enough uh, so that it could Hitler couldn't stop uh, the Finns to uh, go away from his alliance and uh, but it, it must be done after that after the German became vague but before that Red Army arriving to Helsinki there were only three capitals in Europe uh, of the countries participating in the Second World War, uh, where the capitals were not occupied by foreign forces, Moscow, London, and Helsinki. And that was a remarkable success of timing also. Yeah, that's, no, that's a really incredible diplomatic uh, achievement. Let, let's turn to the episode in, in 1948. So Finland had, had survived, it had lost territory in, in the two peace agreements. Uh, and in the peace treaty that was reached after the war in 1947. In 1948, the situation is a little bit different. The United States has announced the Marshall Plan uh, aid, and Finland, um, in order not to raise uh, Soviet hackles, uh, uh, declines to participate uh, in the Marshall Plan. Um, other countries are also in, in uh, Central Europe that are occupied uh, by the Red Army also uh, end up not participating. But in, in February of 1948 in, uh, in Czechoslovakia, uh, the communists are basically in the government. It's a coalition government, but they're basically instructed by Moscow to seize power, and they do. Um, and they exclude the bourgeois parties from from government and uh, Czechoslovakia becomes a, a, a so-called people's democracy. That didn't happen in Finland, but as you make clear in your book, it could have happened. Um, there certainly were plans afoot to make it happen. Why didn't it happen? I think that the main uh, goal of Stalin and, and the Soviet leadership in, in 1948 was to get a military treaty with Finland about alliance in, in case of war. If the Western powers attacked the Soviets through Finnish territory, uh, they wanted the, the Finns to fight the, on the Soviet side. And 
but they knew that this is very difficult for Finland to accept. And so they had plan B. If the Finnish leadership of President Pasiki wouldn't accept this, uh, it would be forced to, to become, the country would be forced to become a people's democracy. And then uh, signature for such an agreement would be easy to, to obtain. And, and here, I think uh, the main thing was probably from the Finnish side, it was uh, President Pasikivi playing time here and, and uh, because the international situation was becoming for the Soviets worse and worse. There were new complications. The break with Yugoslavia was advancing. Uh, the Berlin crisis was uh, 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 in preparation on both sides and uh, other things which uh, would take Soviet resources. So it was rather difficult. And then also I think Stalin saw that it would be taking, getting communists into power in Finland would be much uh, more difficult than in, in Czechoslovakia because in Czechoslovakia the communists were dominant power in, in the government and uh, and they also had a strong position in Czech, Czech military forces and police, but not in Finland, not quite the contrary in the, in the military. Although there's one very interesting part of, of the story, I think, uh, which I think might be different, which is there were some Finnish communists, and I'm thinking here particularly of the interior minister, uh, Uriel Laino, who had some ambivalence about Stalin and some uh, nationalist, they might have been communists, but they were also had some nationalist feeling uh, as well. And some of that seems to uh, be at least partly a result of what happened to uh, many of the Finnish communists who left Finland after the Finnish Civil War in 1918, the Reds who went to, to the Soviet Union, many of whom were killed by, by Stalin in the uh, in the great terror of the 1930s. Is that fair to say, too, that the interior minister kind of decided not to really play along with some of this? I think uh, the Finnish communist leadership was afraid of taking power because they, were, uh, they knew what had happened to their friends and comrades in late 1930s who were in the Soviet Union, and they sensed that this might be again repeated and and then also in, during the war time in, in particular in the winter war the com communist the local communists in finland had taken part fighting the soviet union also at that time it is said that i this, there is not a, a certain source for this but it is said that stalin said that uh, it might be better to make a deal with uh, bourgeois finland led by President Pasikivi, then make it by force a people's democracy and get a left-wing government uh, which hates us, the Soviets. And uh, that might be a factor. And I think certainly it was a factor for the Finnish communists. And Stalin knew that Finnish communists were not so eager to take power because of these reasons. There were some, of course, who were, but most of them not very much. Everybody had lost somebody in the Stalin's terror. Yes, it's a fascinating part of the story that you tell extremely, extremely well. Uh, and I want to come back to, um, you know, some of the source material that, that you used uh, for this. But there's a very interesting uh, episode uh, that you recount in, in your book of a conversation between Stalin and uh, Sir Anthony Eden, the British foreign secretary. And uh, the, the story that you recount is that um, Stalin tells Eden that Hitler is a, a genius of sorts, but that his problem is he doesn't know when to stop. And, and Sir Anthony Eden responds by saying, well, uh, who, who, who knows when to stop? Who, you know, what leader knows when to stop? And Stalin says, I do. And you, yeah. you, you make the point that Stalin was capable of making very um, 
you know, assessing the international situation, whatever, however, you know, good or bad his sources of information may have been, but assessing this, the balance of forces and uh, making U-turns uh, on policy uh, if it served served his purposes. And, and essentially, you recount that these in these three episodes, Stalin assesses the balance and, and, and makes a, a, a U-turn. I mean, one of the things that seems very striking about President Putin is it's not clear at all that however much he may admire Stalin and in some ways, um, you know, uh, emulate Stalin, it's not clear whether he has that same sense of knowing when to stop. Is that a fair judgment, do you think? I think it's uh, as fair as can be. It's uh, evident that uh, that Putin has not, not has had this sense of uh, or ability to, to make a, a sudden turn. But he may still be forced to develop that ability. I, I don't believe he's, we, we have seen all his uh, tricks yet. But Stalin was clearly Stalin's position as a leader of the Soviet Union at that time was stronger than, than Putin's position in present day Russia. So that Stalin was freer to make decisions so that anybody couldn't do anything against him. I mean, yes, uh, uh, critics, uh, you know, did not fare well in Stalin's Russia, although today in Putin's Russia, critics don't seem to be faring very well either. Um, but uh, as you say, it's not his power um, is not as absolute as as Stalin's was, uh, you know, for for sure. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you got all this amazing material? I mean, a, a lot of the material that you cite are reports uh, from um, Soviet intelligence agencies, the uh, NKVD, the, um, uh, the, the um, essentially the predecessor of the current FSB. Um, you have, you know, Western documents that had been uh, acquired by Soviet agents that show up in, uh, in, um, in in uh, in Soviet uh, intelligence uh, materials, how, how did you get access to all of this material, um, and uh, how likely is it that historians are going to be able to continue to access some of this material? The Soviet or Russian archival situation changed quite a lot after the collapse of the Soviet Union. In 1990s, it was possible to get. Uh, very interesting materials uh, by going yourself to the archives and asking. But then uh, in Putin's time, it was changed so that uh, individual researchers were not treated so well as in the 1990s. But the Soviets had this target of uh, uh, getting international cooperation between the scholars and, and we had the Finnish uh, historians, we had an agreement with the Russian Academy of Sciences to to get uh, some materials on the winter war and other, other conflicts. And uh, through that, it was possible to, to get the materials. The Russians, uh, during the first period of Putin, Putin's time, they were uh, keen to favor such projects where uh, there was an official Soviet participant, official Russian participant, taking part in that and, and get the foreigners. And also, I think uh, yeah. at that time, uh, the Russians had the idea that by giving materials on sensitive issues to various uh, foreign scholars, it would help to uh, bet, get a better image for Russia in these nations. For the Poles, uh, the Soviets, uh, the Russians gave materials on the Katyn massacre of the Polish officers in the last week of the Winter War, and uh, or decided in the last week of the Winter War they were killed a little bit later. And uh, the Hungarians, the 1956 uh, Hungarian 
revolution, the suppression of that and things like that. And, and with the Finns, it was evidently the fin winter war. They saw that that was the most sore point in our relations and, and they thought that it would give a better image for them if they would be more honest, honest about that as they used to be because earlier they had to lie many things. And I think it was a good uh, target, but uh, they later abandoned it. And nowadays, it, uh, at, at the present, I think it's not possible to, to get anything comparable from the Soviet archives now. I think we're lucky that you were able to get the material you did and to write this fascinating, fascinating book. You know, there's an old joke um, uh, that goes something like, how, you know, how do you explain uh, the Nordic country's security policies? And the answer is Norway has NATO. Sweden has Finland and Finland has a very long border with the Soviet Union. Um, talk a little bit, if you would, about the role that Sweden played, because, you know, you you not only mined the archives in, in Russia and, and Finland, uh, President Pasekivi's diary and other uh, sources like that, um, uh, but also uh, Swedish uh, records as well. And the Russian uh, ambassador, Soviet ambassador, um, Alexandra Kolontai, uh, woman ambassador to Sweden for a long, long time, a revolutionary colleague of Lenin's, plays a very important role in this story that you tell. So can, t can you tell us a little bit about how Sweden uh, came to play a role here? Yeah, I think in, in many, many Finns have a negative attitude to, to Sweden. Uh, Sweden's role in the war. Many think that uh, Sweden didn't help uh, enough. But I think uh, Sweden helped quite a lot uh, already uh, with its mere existence because it was very important for the fate of Finland that uh, seen from Moscow on the other side of Finland was Sweden and not Germany. Like the Poles. Poles had the Germany there or the Baltics had the Germany there, even Czechs and Hungarians had the Germany. So uh, it was much easier for the Soviets to, to deal with a country who didn't have such an aggressive big power on the other side, decided to help it. They were, they respected Sweden quite a lot, astonishingly a lot, but uh, they didn't have to be afraid of it. It was too, too small for them to be afraid of unlike Germany. So it was easier for them. And also technically, uh, Sweden was neutral. It was um, possible to use Sweden as a channel between Finland and, and the Soviets when a channel was needed. So it, it was very good uh, for the... F I, I think without Sweden, uh, Finland wouldn't have got such a peace. It got. So the help was great. It was they. It's true that they sent in the winter war. They sent some volunteers and troops into the north of Finland, which was of course symbolically and even operationally important. But the military help was not not decisive. The political help and and financial help were the, the most decisive part of the Finnish of the Swedish help to Finland. And. Um for Finland and Sweden both now, um, their uh, membership in NATO is going to be a, a relatively a different experience uh, for them. I mean, there's a strategic culture that uh, developed, I think, in both countries, different in both countries, but in Finland, a culture of um, uh, historic neutrality. Um, in in Finland, uh, a uh, a culture of uh, uh, a strategic culture of being alone uh, and having to make one's own way, um, and therefore having to be um, you know very careful, very uh, precise, but always a very strong sense of being alone. Um, do you think that it that it's going to take a while for 
Finns and Swedes to uh, become acculturated to, you know, planning for a, a, a military alliance of 32 nations? It may take its time, it's, uh, but uh, I think now, in particular in Finland, uh, the, the atmosphere is now so that uh, the situation has changed rather uh, fast in Finland, so that the, the opinions about NATO and, and cooperation with NATO have changed, changed by Putin's attack to Ukraine. And, and I think Finland probably is more adaptive than Sweden, but uh, on the other hand, Sweden has a long tradition of uh, secret cooperation with NATO already during the Cold War, which uh, is not so strong tradition in Finland. Finland must have been uh, much more careful because of the Soviet, fear of the Soviet rea reactions to any cooperation with, with the Western powers. So uh, Sweden can, be, can build on that basis uh, their cooperation during the Cold War. So it remains to be seen how, how fast it will be going. We're, uh, we're running a, you know, short of time, but I, I do want to ask you, um, you know, I, I don't want to uh, corrupt uh, the history that you've done with presentism, but um, it, it is inevitable, I think, that when one looks at um, the work that you've done on, on Finland survival, that people think about, uh, about what's happening today between Russia and uh, Ukraine. Um, the late Zbigniew Brzezinski, for instance, frequently would talk about the solution for Ukraine is Finlandization, as he, as he put it. Um, Finlandization, I know from my time living in, in Finland, is, is a, a term that you know, many Finns, I, correctly in my view, uh, take offense at um, in the sense that it is uh, frequently in the West seen as a, a sign of uh, diminished independence and nationhood. And from the Finnish point of view, and as your book certainly shows, the ability of Finland to survive in the circumstances that it, it faced uh, in the uh, 1940s and, and beyond uh, is really the true story of, of of what happened, but what lessons, if any, do you think there are from Finland's experience with Soviet Russia in the 1940s and into the 1950s and what Ukraine faces today? Are there any lessons to be learned? For the Finns, there are, of course, several lessons. Uh, and the main lesson, I think, is that uh, for Finland, the combination of uh, ability to resistance and, and military ability uh, connected with the uh, ability to compromises when needed and, and made sacrifices. Also the Finns, uh, the Finnish idea, President Koivisto wrote uh, a book of, of the Russian idea, what's the idea of Russia after he, uh, he was retired and it was translated into Russian, and a Russian reporter asked uh, Mr. President, uh, what then is the idea of Finland? And he answered, to survive. And, and that's a, a very uh, apt description of, uh, of the Finnish attitude. So the Finns were able to, to do both sides. They had this uh, uh, strong uh, willingness to defend the country, even by military means, but then also the ability to make compromises when needed. Tanner, the, the social democratic leader during the war, he said that uh, we must be able to, to cut one limb to save the body. And that was what they did during the war. And of course, I think for the Finnish uh, success in, in this, it was, uh, there was a great effect also for the fact that uh, when the areas were ceded to the Soviets uh, after the war, uh, the population was not left 
they all came, almost all came to Finland, which was left. And uh, so nobody was remained there and it, uh, it would have been very destructive for post-war relations if there had, would have been uh, a Finnish minority uh, which was, would have been strongly oppressed by the Soviet authorities. Uh, it would ha wouldn't have been possible. In the Ukraine, probably, I think this uh, compromise feeling which, which the Finns clearly had, it's not so strong probably in, in Ukraine. And also, I think this uh, suffering of the population, civilian population, has been much greater in Ukraine uh, than it was in Finland during the war. So it creates some uh, different factors in the situation. You make the point, um, you know, I think that the number of civilian casualties in the um, Finnish winter war was only uh, about 2000 and uh, the, um, the uh, casualties uh, for, I mean, the disproportion between military casualties suffered on the Finnish side and the civilian casualties is, you know, absolutely astonishing. And as you say, it, it created this um, uh, potential political openness to, to compromise. Uh, it, it, you know, I think for the benefit of uh, our, our listeners here at, at Shield of the Republic, uh, when you say that the Finns uh, in the territory that the Soviets took in Karelia were evacuated to Finland, it was 400,000 people, which was more than 10% of the population of Finland. I mean, I think the overall Finnish population was something on the order of 3 million plus or something uh, yeah. in, in, in 1940. So 400,000 people being relocated uh, from the Karelian uh, you know, territories that were uh, ultimately taken over by the Soviets into Finland, to what's today's Finland, it, it was an extraordinary uh, event. I know when I was ambassador, lots of people uh, whom I met and, and uh, came to know, I believe President Atisari, in fact, who was president when I was there, his family was uh, evacuated from Karelia. So uh, this was a very, very big deal and a huge undertaking um, by by Finland. And, and you, you know, you don't hear Finns complain about it and say, oh, you know, woe is us, you know, this terrible thing happened. And Finns just, it was you know, part of doing business with a big, ugly neighbor next door. Yeah. And I think also the, the small number of civilian losses was very important for the post war relations in, in both wars, uh, uh, the winter war and, and the continuation war after that, we lost about 90,000 90, soldiers dead, which is a great number for a, a small country. Uh, but in a perverse sense, you can call natural the fact that the young men are killed in the war. But the civilian losses were only 2,000. And you don't find that proportion in any European country. Even the English uh, lost more civilians because of the heavy bombings. But, uh, but the Finns did not. And, and it created the atmosphere after the war that we were able to protect the civilian population and we were able to uh, stand the war period, why don't we would be able to stand also the period of peace? Yes. Well, our guest today has been Professor Kimo Rentala, the author of How Finland Survived Stalin, published by Yale University Press. Uh, it's a terrific work of history, and I learned a lot. I, I thought I knew a lot about the Winter War and uh, the Continuation War. But I learned a lot from reading this book, and I'm very grateful to you for uh, writing it. I'm grateful to uh, Finland's ambassador to the United States, Mikko Hautala, for arranging for it to be uh, translated into English. I think um, there's a lot, a lot to be learned here. And uh, thank you very much for joining us on Shield of the Republic. Okay, thank you.